kind of drew me in. Every time I might have pulled out, something else came along to pull me back. And I think now what we have going for us is also a similar number of very spectacular events. We had one last year, the great American solar eclipse. We've got another coming our way in another week or so, the lunar eclipse and other events which I'll go into. But I want to just go over, again, how this got started for me uh, to answer that question. I guess it got started for me, in fact, I know it got started for me, on a warm, muggy summer day, Saturday, in July of 1963, when there was a total eclipse of the sun over Maine and a large partial eclipse over the tri-state metropolitan area. This is from the front page of the New York Times that day. As you can see here in New York, almost 90% of the sun was going to get covered in the late afternoon. Notice also at the bottom of the page, Weather Bureau's prediction is for variable cloudiness and scattered showers. Well, we did have a few brief spurts of rain, I remember, that Saturday afternoon. It was, again, one of those warm, <coughs> muggy, humid days. And thanks to a friend of mine over at CBS, Mike Kentrianakis, he was able to dig back in the CBS archives, and he found a piece of film that aired that day in July of 1963 of the eclipse, as it was seen uh, from the Empire State Building. And there it is, right there. Now... From my vantage point, this is from the Empire State Building, from my vantage point in Throg's Neck, we had fitful glimpses of the sun during the first half of the eclipse, not very much in the way of visibility. We also were out there, I remember with my grandparents, my mom, my sister, we were out there watching. We had a radio, the kitchen radio we brought outside, and we were listening to NBC, and they had two people from the Hayden Planetarium that afternoon on NBC Radio describing the eclipse, Dr. Fred Hess, which many of you I'm sure remember, one of the great orators of astronomy, and Ben Grauer, who always used to go to Times Square when they had the uh, ball drop. He would be a very excited voice when the ball was dropping for NBC. So we didn't see much until the moment when the sun was at its maximum, at 549, and then at that particular point, when the sun was almost 90% covered, the sun broke through for our view, and this more or less is what we saw from the Bronx, a crescent sun through the clouds in the sky. You heard Fred Hess and Ben Grauer, and there it is! We have, we have the maximum of the eclipse, and there was a counterfeit twilight that fell over the tri-state area for a couple of minutes, darkening the sky, and oh, it was that. Anyway, when I saw that, I, it just blew my mind. I was not quite seven years old, but it still blew my mind. And that evening, my grandmother later said I was a little chatterbox. I just kept talking over and over and over about what we had just seen in the sky. Uh, many years later, this is a, 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 the front piece of the story I wrote for Reader's Digest in 1997 relating this particular uh, event. And I, uh, the name of the piece is called The Promise because that afternoon at the dinner table, I, say, I, I would say, Peepa, wasn't that something, Peepa? What, wasn't that something? Well, my grandfather was in New York in 1925 when we had the total eclipse of the sun pass over the New York metropolitan area. And my grandfather said, yeah, that was, that was great, but I made a big mistake today. I said, what do you mean you made a big mistake? He said, he looks to my grandmother, he says, I should have taken him to Maine where the eclipse was total. I said, total? He says, was it as good as what we just saw? I said, Joey, you ain't seen nothing yet no. until you see a total eclipse of the sun. And he promised me <laughs> the next day we found out when the next eclipse was going to occur. And nine years later, up in Capshat, Quebec, we actually saw, we took a leisurely 900-mile drive. <laughs> and we saw the total eclipse of the sun from a little town on the Gaspé Peninsula. And it was an, a memorable, memorable event for me. And I guess in that nine-year wait, while we were waiting for him to keep his promise, I got involved with astronomy. Two years after the 63 eclipse in October of 65, we had the brightest comet of the 20th century, Comet Achaea Secchi, a, a rare Kreutz sun grazer. This is the type of comet that heads straight for the sun, as if it was going to collide with the sun. And at the very last minute, within a few hundred thousand miles of the solar surface, it does a hairpin curve around the sun moving at a million miles an hour, it moves back out into space. And of course, 
coming that close to the sun, comets get very, very bright. This one was getting brighter by the day. And you know what? Couldn't see it at all as we were <coughs> heading toward the perihelion, the closest point. Why? I circled it in blue there. Unfortunately, persons in this area will not be able to see it because of adverse atmospheric conditions. You know what it was like? It was your typical Indian summer weather pattern. You'd wake up in the morning and you had schmutz, low clouds, <laughs> haze, fog. Mid-morning, late morning, the sun would burn through. Afternoon, <coughs> beautifully clear. And then as soon as the sun went down and the air cooled, all the schmutz came back. And this was a morning comet before sunrise. Every morning, I was out there in the schmutz looking. And I didn't know what I was looking for. They said a comet. I'd never seen a comet. I, and when they said, comet will rise at 5 o'clock, this is what I thought was happening. I thought I would be looking, and I'd see the comet rise and move across the sky like a slow-moving shooting star. It was in the southeast. I'd look south. I'd look east. I'd look overhead. I didn't know what the heck I was looking for. I had no idea, no clue. Then on the morning of October 21st, the comet swept around the sun, <coughs> making its closest approach. And we were still schmutzed out. But Dr. Kenneth Franklin, the chief astronomer at the Hayden Planetarium for many, many years, was not going to be denied. He got a five-passenger Cessna. He chartered a five-passenger Cessna, I guess on the bill of the, uh, of the Museum of Natural History. And a reporter from NBC News was up there with him. And they went up 12,000 feet over West Point to try to see the comet in the daytime, because it was expected to be bright enough to see in the daytime. Well, as you can see, look at the bottom up there. That's, that's the schmutz that was covering the New York area. There you see the rising sun. On the Big Wilson, how many of you remember Big Wilson on NBC Radio in the morning back in the 60s? My, again, we were an NBC family back then. My grandmother used to listen. And on the Big Wilson show, and Big Wilson, by the way, later became the announcer for the Star Hustler. Remember the Star Hustler with Jack Horkheimer? Yeah. And when he'd introduced Jack Horkheimer and everything, that was Big Wilson. So I guess he had an astronomy side of, of him. And uh, so here's Dr. Franklin. Well, we're looking. We can't see it, unfortunately. We're, we'll, we'll keep looking and treat, keep up. All right, Dr. Franklin, thank you very much. This is live on NBC Radio. I'm sitting at the breakfast table listening to this and listening to Dr. Franklin. And so they played a couple of records. All of a sudden, right in the middle of a record, Big Wilson stops. And he says, we've got a special. We, we're in contact. Dr. Franklin, you've seen the comet. And Dr. Franklin said, yes, yes. We, 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 just, we finally got a view of it. The, the atmosphere is cleared enough. And we're able to see it. It's in the upper right, to the upper right of the rising sun. And we're clearly able to see it with the unaided eye. What a beautiful, and in binoculars, there it is, right there. There it is. 10,000 times brighter than Venus. 10 times brighter than the full moon. Negative 15 was the magnitude as it moved around the sun that morning. An amazing sight. And of course, we saw nothing of it because here in New York, we were still schmutzed out. I thought that was it. I said, no, that's, I missed a fantastic chance to see a, a great comet in the sky today. Until a few days later. And then this gentleman helped me. How many of you remember? Do you, do you recognize the face? You know who this guy is up there talking to that, that kid? He was the host of Wonderama. No? no? Yeah, yeah, exactly. See, there you go. Sonny Fox. Somebody remembers. Because wow. a lot of people... When I say the host of Wonderama, they say Bob McAllister. Yeah, Bob McAllister was the host for a number of years, but before Bob McAllister came along, Sonny Fox was the host. Sonny ran Wonderama a little differently than Bob McAllister. Bob McAllister more or less had like a kiddie show. Sonny Fox had a more or less show for young adults, and he wanted to get the kids to learn about current events. And since the comet was so much in the news that week, who did he have as his guest on Wonderama? Dr. Franklin. So Dr. Franklin sat down, he talked about the comet, he talked about uh, what it was all about, what a comet is, talked about the viewpoint that he saw from the plane, and that's when Sonny said more or less what I was going to say. Well, now that Dr. Franklin, the comet swept around the sun, it's, it's pretty well gone now. We're not going to see it anymore. And Dr. Franklin said, oh, on the contrary, that the comet is going to be very visible for the next couple of weeks, and we fully expect it to grow a long tail since it was so close to the sun. Our problem is we don't have the good weather. But if the weather gets good in the next couple of weeks, and then he told how to see it. Don't expect a streaking object. Don't expect, it doesn't streak across the sky like a meteor or a shooting star. Instead, 
It moves a little bit night after night against the background of stars, depending upon the perspective of which way we see it. And he said, he said, look, the comet will, the head of the comet will rise around five o'clock in the morning, but the tail will already be well above the horizon at that time. Look to the southeast, you should be able to see it. And they even had a, it was very funny, Dr. Franklin said they were gonna have a special comet watch at the South Street Seaport Museum, a combination comet watch and chowder breakfast. <laughs> I begged my mom, I said, Mom, let's go to the chowder breakfast and see Dr. Franklin and see the comet finish. It was gonna rise over the eastern end of the Brooklyn Bridge from that vantage point. My mother, of course, said, what time? Five o'clock. Go back to sleep, Joe. But I never got a chance. In fact, that Sonny Fox, because again, we had all the schmutz, he said, well, Dr. Franklin, what happens if we still have the clouds and the red thing? What, what, what happens then? And Dr. Franklin said, well, guess we'll have another bowl of chowder. <laughs> well, a few days after his appearance on Wonderama, lo and behold, a cold front came through. The skies cleared. It got to be your beautiful, perfect autumn weather. Blue skies, bright sun, clear skies at night. I was ready. Five o'clock in the morning, first morning out with the clear weather. I, I got up, looked, and there it was. Wow. Now, you can go on Google <laughs> and pick and, and type in Comet Akeaseki. Most, if not all of the pictures you'll see is of the comet. But it doesn't really give you an idea, or ga you can gauge how big or how large it was in the sky. This was taken by a Bayer Nunn camera in Arizona. That bright patch there is not a light dome, that's the zodiacal light. And I'll, uh, let's see, let's see how many of you are up on your astronomy. <coughs> what pattern of stars is there? Do you recognize it? Shout it out if you recognize it. Leo. Leo, right, see, there's the sickle and the hind quarters of the lion. So now you have an idea of just how big this guy was. Wow. Now I've seen comets. I've been very fortunate in my lifetime to see more than a few great comets. Bennett, 1970. West, 1976. Yakotake, 1996. Hale Bopp, 97. All beautiful celestial showpieces, but this, this comet, the tail, how bright it was. It was like a narrow searchlight sticking up from the horizon. I live right across the street from my junior high school, junior high, junior high school 101 in the Bronx, and I never got a chance to see the head. The head was always behind the high school, but I sure as heck saw the tail, like a searchlight. It was like somebody put a searchlight behind the school, and I saw that on a number of different mornings after. I, I don't think I would have seen it if I hadn't caught, it, caught Dr. Franklin on Wonderama talking to Sonny Fox. And soon everybody was noting the comet. Even in the city, people were seeing it on the top, on rooftops, and especially so out in suburban locations. Comet Akeaseki, a fantastically beautiful comet. And I saw it, as I said, on a number of mornings, and finally I got and sat down one day and wrote a letter of thanks to Dr. Franklin. I said, I saw you on Wonderama. I, I heard how you, you gave the instructions on how and when to look, at, look for the comet. I never would have saw this if it weren't for you. <clears throat> and I finished the letter by saying, someday I'd like a chance to meet you. I said, I, I, would, I wanted to see you at the chowder breakfast, but my mom wouldn't take me. But uh, if I ever get a chance, I always want a chance to meet. Well, wouldn't you know, a week later, I got a letter from Dr. Franklin. Very official looking letter. Opened up and said, I'd like a chance to meet you, young man. And arrangements were made on a Friday afternoon. Um, I, I don't remember the exact date. My grandfather took me down to uh, the Hayden Planetarium where I sat there with Dr. Franklin for 45 minutes while we chatted at ease. You know, if you're going to get into an advocation, if you're going to get started in a hobby or whatever, you've got to meet a few, be lucky and meet a few good people. And this man was a great person for me. Um, I knew him for over 40 years. He was uh, a master scientist. He was the discoverer of radiation, radio emissions from Jupiter, for goodness sake. He had every opportunity to just stand there and just say, oh, I got a kid a letter from a kid, throw it in the pail. I, I, I don't want to be bothered with that. Dr. Franklin was so wonderful, and especially when astronomy, uh, astronomical events, celestial events came up, he would talk to Walter Cronkite, but he would also talk to a reporter on a 250 watt radio station in Podunk, Nebraska. He was, uh, one of the, he had, he, he it never went to his head. 
He never went Hollywood, so to speak, as uh, other individuals that I have met over the years um, have, uh, have gone. Um, he would never say no to a request uh, unless it happened to be somebody from the hierarchy of the high end of the news media, uh, or, you know, uh, uh, Stephen Colbert, for example. If, it, if it anything lower than that, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, Dr. Franklin was not like that at all. And I was a friend of his, as I said, as I grew up in my formative years, um, I, as I got into high school and college, I would send him, I'd ask him, I'd say, would you look this over? Because I always had aspirations of writing astronomy articles and writing science articles. I'd ask him, would you look at this for me? Can you imagine that? The audacity of somebody who's like 15 or 18, you know, writing to a master scientist saying, would you look this over and see if it's not? And he, he said yes. He said yes. He did that on more than one occasion. You know, I heard uh, comedians say, that when they made their first appearance on The Tonight Show, that after uh, they would finish their routine and the people would be applauding, they always would look over to the desk where Johnny was, Johnny Carson. And if Johnny went like this, that was the validation that you were funny and that you certainly uh, were going to make it in, in the business. And if you were called over to the desk to sit down with Johnny, Johnny would go like that, come on over here. That's, that's when you knew that you really made it in the business. Well, to me, to get a letter back from Dr. Franklin and say, this looks pretty darn good, Joe. Great, keep up the good work. That was the, the validation. And one day, he didn't bother to write. He called. He called me up. This was when I was in college. And uh, he said, this really looks good. I was writing for a magazine which no longer exists, Star and Sky magazine. Uh, only last for a couple of years. He said, this really looks like a great piece. And I said, thank you very much, Dr. Frank. And the doctor, he said, he said, Joe, could you do me a favor? I said, what? He said, you, you've been calling me Dr. Franklin for as long as I, it's Ken. Call me Ken. For me, that was like being called over to the desk. That was, that was it. Great, great man, Dr. Franklin. Now, a year after the brightest comet of the 20th century came the biggest meteor shower of the 20th century the Leonid shower of 1966. And a uh, big to-do about that. And of course, naturally, the skies were mostly cloudy that night. The Hayden Planetarium actually had a meteor watch in the Sheep Meadow at Central Park. And they, at 10, and even despite the fact that it was cloudy, 10,000 people showed up at the Sheep Meadow to listen to a lecture by Dr. Tom Nicholson that night. Where was Ken Franklin? He was back up in the plane. He was flying around above the clouds, above the New York metropolitan area, hoping to see the big meteor storm that had been anticipated. And, you know, it was a mid midnight, one, two, three in the morning. So uh, for me, disappointed as I was, I didn't get a chance to spend an all night or under the stars and count meteors. I spent it in my room listening to the radio, WNBC, and Dr. Franklin was on a show, an overnight radio show, hosted by this guy a gentleman by the name of Long John Neville. Long John, for those of you who remember, was the prehistoric Art Bell. He would have all kinds of people come on his show who had been carried off in UFOs or had visited the planet <laughs> Venus and Mars and all kinds of... One night I remember uh, he, he supposedly told everybody, you know, the Empire State Building is on the equivalent of a giant lazy Susan, and during the overnight hours, the building turns it makes a 360 degree evolution. People, and you know what? What's the frightening thing is, the NBC, WNBC single at night got out to 37 states. And more than once, the phone lines at NBC got blown out from all the people trying to call into Long John. Anyway, Dr. Franklin was in an airplane. And every half hour, I'm listening to this show, every half hour, he's reporting from the airplane. Well, we see, we saw a couple of really nice bright meteors. Or, you know, well... Just a few seconds ago, I saw a brilliant bolide go flying by, but that was a spectacular thing. But that's the way it was, every half hour. And Long John would say, well, what about the storm, Dr. Franklin? You predicted a big meteor shower, a storm. Where is it? Well, it hasn't come yet. And finally, at 4 o'clock, Dr. Franklin said, well, we've been up here for four hours, and I guess we're not going to see the meteor storm, so we're going to take it back to LaGuardia. 
Thank you very much uh, there for giving us the time, uh, Long John. All right, Dr. Franklin, better luck in the meteor shower comes every 33 years. Better luck in 33 years, Dr. Franklin, you know, that kind of thing. And he went down. Big mistake by Dr. Franklin. Because after he put the plane down, that's when the show began. An hour before sunrise in New York, had it been clear, we would have seen a thousand meteors per hour. Then the sun came up. That was it for New York. But in the central and western states, the shower was getting even stronger. People out there were seeing, one guy wrote, I saw a rain of meteors turn into a hail of meteors and finally a storm of meteors. We were seeing 30 and 40 per second, wow. over 100,000 per hour. Oh my God. Will we ever get a chance to see something like that again? Put that in the back of your memory. Put it in your memory banks. I'll make a reference to it maybe perhaps later. The Great Leonid Shower of 1966. In 68, we had a total eclipse of the moon. And it was coming on, it says April 13th in the diagram, but that's universal time. It was on a Friday night, April the 12th, 1968. I had just gotten a new telescope, and I had, I had Sky and Telescope had a whole list of things that the amateur observer could do. You could time when the moon starts moving into the shadow. You could time when it moved out of the shadow. You could time when the shadow was moving over many of the prominent craters. You can make estimates of the colors that occur on the surface of the moon during totality, the brightness of, the, of a totally eclipsed moon. They haven't done that in recent years. I was kind of ch chagrined about that. But back then, they gave a whole laundry list of things that you could do and observations you could make. And I was ready. I was all set. I had a whole list of things I was planning to do from the start of that eclipse. And then my mother got involved with this and said, Joe, uh, you're going to church that night. You see, Friday, April 12th was Good Friday and good Catholics that we were, my mother would not allow me to miss the Good Friday service. If you're a Catholic, you know that that's probably the most solemn mass of the entire year. That's when everything is draped, the stations of the cross are draped in black crepe. It's very quiet, very mournful. The priest would sit there for many, many minutes, not really saying or doing anything, because it is, after all, the, the, the crucifixion of, of Christ. And I was forced to go to that mass. The mass was starting at 9 o'clock. The eclipse was going to begin at 10.10. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole story. You, any of you want to read the story, this is how uh, the October Reader's Digest. If you'd like to see the story and read it for yourself, all you have to do is go to www.rd.com slash eclipse, and you can read the whole story. Uh, just the uh, fact of the matter was that... Um, as we're coming up on 10 o'clock, I'm looking at the clock in the church. <laughs> and I kept nudging my mother saying, Mom, I'm going to miss the eclipse. Mom, Mom. And she's like staring straight. And I did something which probably will end up, may, may, may have got, ended up being roasting on a spit uh, when, I, when I die. I bolted out of the church and interrupted the, the, the mass by running down the marble floor, opening up the big brass doors up front. <laughs> And then running out of the church, and then the door is slamming shut. Boom! <laughs> My mother died a thousand deaths. So embarrassed. But I was saved by the pastor, the priest, the monsignor that night, Father Patrick Okada. And for you to find out how he saved me, I invite you to read the story. Again, rd.com slash eclipse. Well, I made my observation. I saw the eclipse that night from start to finish. And I... After the eclipse was over, I, I made all my observations, put it on a piece of paper, sent it off to Sky and Telescope. I figured I was going to get published. I said, this is it. Didn't realize the fact that the eclipse was visible, of course, all over all of North America, and that there were literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Sky and Telescope had seven pages on the eclipse for the, in the June issue. But back then, they also had a policy where if you sent something to us, a photograph or maybe a, 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 your observations, will still at least recognize you by mentioning you at the end of the story. And there I am, Yay. right there. The first time I've I have been published innumerable times since in many magazines and articles or whatever. I can tell you, seriously, nothing thrilled me more than to see that at the end of that article. That was the biggest, one of the biggest thrills in my entire life was to see me finally in print, published in whatever way possible. Now, also, I was, of course, obviously I wasn't the only one. There were many, many others. You notice another familiar name on this long list? There you go. 
Al Nagler, A. Nagler, Spring Balance. I wonder if this was Al's first foray into, uh, into publishing or into a Sky and Telescope, but there he was up there. We were all out, we all saw a, a beautiful eclipse. That got me started. That's it. When I tell people I would, I've been an amateur, how long have you been an amateur astronomer, Joe? I date that back to this. That was over 50 years ago. And of course I've made, I've been outside, had thousands of hours under the stars, I've written many, many articles, and in fact now it comes around full circle. Because I learned how to make those observations from Sky and Telescope in April 1968 edition, and now, 50 years later, those of you who have Sky and Telescope, January, the cover story, The Great American Lunar Eclipse, by written, Joe however modestly, by Joe Rayo. Yay. There you go. That's how, it, that's how you get started. All right, and that's the number one. That's the number one event coming up is, of course, the lunar eclipse. Beautiful sight. You know, one thing, and when we show this in a planetarium, they, they, when the moon is in totality, the whole moon turns red. But it's really not that way, because the moon is actually a, a, a probe that goes through the shadow, and depending upon where the, sha where the moon goes relative to the center of the shadow, see, uh, this coming eclipse coming up, the northern or upper part of the moon is going to be closest to the edge of the shadow. That'll be the brightest part of the moon at mid-totality. Meanwhile, the center of the shadow is going to be down here, so the darkest part of the moon will be at the bottom part. So you have a real interesting gradation of color in different shades of, uh, of, of brightness during a total eclipse of the, of the moon. And why do I call this the Great American Eclipse? <coughs> Quite simply, this is our eclipse, folks. It doesn't happen very often. We've had lunar eclipses in the past, I'm, I know, that have been visible from various parts of the Earth, but this time, the moon is going to be directed, North America is going to be directed right toward the moon during the total phase of the eclipse. All of the red zones, all the places that are in red, will see the entire eclipse from start to finish. Hey, look, even the folks in Europe, the UK will see it, although much closer to moonset and sunrise early on Monday morning. Hawaii, they'll have an interesting view. The moon that night for them will rise half covered already, moving toward totality. So look at all of this region that is going to have a visibility or view of the eclipse. Now this is going to be a high eclipse, by the way. You know, I'm sure you've seen lunar eclipses before. The moon is like over there or over there. I've seen a couple of eclipses where the moon actually has risen right after, uh, just before totality, right down near the horizon. But this eclipse, when I was doing a little bit of research, I saw the number 70. 70 degrees high in the sky? I said, I don't remember. I've, I've been, been around for a long time. I don't remember a lunar eclipse or a total eclipse. 70 degrees high up in the sky? That's, that's something. I did a little bit of research. So here we go, the 70 degree club. Here are all the eclipses of the past and of the future that have been as high as 70 degrees. The first, December 4th, 1797. John Adams second president of the United States back then. The White House wasn't built until 1800. So John Adams, when he took over as president, took over from his own estate. You know he was very big into wine and vineyards or whatever John Adams was? In fact, he ran, when he, when he was being the second president, he ran on that platform. He told everybody, make America great again. <laughs> that was the last time. Don't worry, they get worse as this talk goes on. <laughs> 1797. Then comes our eclipse. 70 degrees high. So we have not had an eclipse, a total eclipse from the New York metropolitan area as high up as 70 degrees, going back to uh, the, eight, the beginning of the 18th century or the end of the 18th century. And then the next time we get a 70 degree plus eclipse will be in 2113. Look at the date. January 1st, what a New Year's that's going to be, if it's clear for amateur astronomers and professionals in the far distant future. So it begins. I'm already waiting to see the inaccurate newspaper articles telling everybody that the eclipse will begin at about 9.30. That's when the moon moves into the penumbra of the Earth. Well, you can't see anything when the moon is in the penumbra. It's much too uh, dim a shadow, much too faint uh, for you to see. But as the moon draws deeper and deeper into the Earth's penumbra and eventually approaches the umbral shadow, you'll begin to see a smudge on the left-hand side of the moon. 10.33 p.m., a week from this Sunday night, 
The moon begins to move into the Earth's umbra. A little over an hour later, we have totality. Totality is going to last a little longer than usual for most, 62 minutes. It will be total at about 12.09, mid-totality at 12.09, and then the moon will move, begin to move out of the Earth's shadow and then progress out of the umbra. And finally, the last contact with the umbra will be at 1.50 a.m. early Monday morning. And the moon will look pretty much the way it usually does to us. And then after that, it will have to take another hour to move out of the Earth's penumbra. That comes just before 3 a.m. I'm sure all of you, certainly I, will be watching the Inside the Eyelid show at that particular hour, hopefully, if there is anything to see that night. Now, this is going to be a special eclipse for me, personally, because my very first total eclipse of the moon was December 18, 1964. It was a Friday night, the week before Christmas, and it was also an eclipse. Every time we have a lunar eclipse, for whatever reason, my mind goes back to this eclipse, the first one. I've seen 17 others since. But I call this the Mr. Magoo eclipse. Why? Because not only was I a big fan or a growing fan of astronomy, but I was a big fan of cartoons. And there was a special that used to air on NBC, Channel 4, in New York, Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol. Anybody remember that? Oh, yeah. oh, sure. Back then, it was a big thing. It's hard for kids today to realize in the fractured media environment, the social media environment, where we have hundreds of channels that we can see on cable and on, uh, uh, you know, on your dish. Uh, or you can do, you get a DVD. You want to see Mr. Magoo? Stick the DVD in. It could be the 4th of July. You can watch it. That was the case back then. 64, it was a one-shot deal. We couldn't even tape it. It was DVD. Uh, VCRs weren't even invented yet. And this show, which was uh, The Voice of Mr. Magoo, was by Jim Backus. Yeah. And it was, it, was, it was the kind of a show that all the whole family could get around and watch. You'd build your whole week of TV watching around a special like this. And when they said that this was going to happen, I said, no, it's during the eclipse. How am I going to do? But what I did was I ended up watching Mr. Magoo. And then during the commercial breaks for Timex watches, I'd run outside and watch the, watch the changing phase. Actually, if you think about it, you know, I, I could have stood out there in the cold, freezing cold, you know, and watched the moon shadow, uh, the earth shadow progress slowly across. But it was better this way. I'm, I'm being entertained by Mr. Magoo. We have a commercial. I run out. Oh, the bite is even bigger now than I last saw it with the last commercial. Order. And then came totality. And it, it, was, it was great. Now, I say that this eclipse is going to be special because it is related. There is a cycle called the Saros cycle. Eclipses recur. There's a specific cycle. Every 18 years, 11 and a third days, the same type of eclipse will return and reappear on the surface of the Earth. Um, it's a solar eclipse. The shadow of the moon is going to fall one third of a day or 120 degrees in longitude further to the west, as opposed to when it officially occurred now. You have to wait. So after three Saro cycles, after three cycles, that's three thirds, the, the whole thing comes back to the same vicinity of the Earth. And the eclipse that you saw three Saro cycles ago, which turned out to be, in this case, 54 years and 33 days, give or take a day, depending upon how many leap years have <coughs> elapsed during that 54 day period, that's called an exeglismos. That's what the Greeks called it. The Greeks, the, you know, you say, ah, oh, what are these people two and three and four thousand years ago? No, they knew a lot more about astronomy in some cases, in many cases, than the average person who was walking on 53rd Street, you know, today. They watched the sky. They charted the sky. They knew all these cycles. And so they called this triple Saros period the exeglismos. And we've got one. December 18th, 1964, the night of Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol and the total eclipse that I first saw, happened at 10 p.m., 54 years, 33 years, uh, thir 54 54 years, 33 day, days later, January 21st, 12 midnight, 2019, the same eclipse, for all intents and purposes, comes back and repeats. There's some differences, shades of differences, but it's the same type of eclipse that occurred way back when. So if I get a chance to see this coming up in, in another week or so, it'll bring back memories of, oh, Magoo, you've done it again. <laughs> now, before I move on to the next Celestial <coughs> Spectacular, and since I am, after all, your friendly neighborhood weatherman on Bios 1, 
No, I didn't retire. I'm not at that other station anymore. I moved on to a different station, and that's where I am now. But I'm sure that you're all wondering, what's the weather look like for the night of the eclipse, Joe? So I looked at the long-range weather map. Oh, my God, it's my, I'm working again. I took a night off, and here I am doing what I normally do. So here's New York City. You're probably wondering what all this is. Down there, this is uh, Zero Z Monday, uh, Monday the 21st of January. So this is 7 p.m., on Sunday night, January 20th, Eastern Time. That happens to be a storm. That happens to be precipitation. This blue line is the rain-snow line, and all of this that you see here enveloping the New York metropolitan area would be snow. And this looks to be a fairly significant, you know the fact it hasn't snowed around here since that mid-November atrocity? We've had 57 straight days with hardly any snow. If this pans out, we're going to make up for all of those days in one night no. on the night of the eclipse. That's, that would be 7 p.m. And the next morning, Monday morning at 7 a.m., the storm has now moved off to east of Cape Cod, and we're in a clearing sector. The skies are finally clear. So you're saying now, so that means, Joe, we're going to miss the eclipse because it's going to snow, it's going to be cloudy weather. Well, that's what we're going to have if you believe this. Remember, this is a long-range map, and this is nine days from now. And you know what they tend to do, these models, over a span of nine days? They tend to wobble and waver back and forth. So it's quite possible, in fact, I would tell you right now, it never works out exactly the way it's progged nine days in advance. We have to get closer in and get a better... So I will say this, there will be some kind of a weather disturbance that weekend. Our hope has to be that it doesn't fit this time frame. That either this thing either waits until the eclipse occurs and then moves in, or moves out really fast and the sky's clear uh, during that Sunday and Sunday night. So we'll see how that all pans out. But right now, that's how it's looking for um, it. In other words, it's going to be a week of agita as you watch the weather forecast if you're hoping for good weather for the eclipse. Also in 2019, November 11th, there's a little black spot on the sun today. <laughs> Mercury. We have a transit of Mercury. Quite frankly, I'm not excited about this, but it's going to be the last time we'll have a chance to see this until May of 2049, if you plan to stay in the New York area. Mercury, a tiny dot. This is not like the transit of Venus. This is the transit of Venus. I get real excited. But Mercury, well, it's going to look like a little dot approximately 1 195th the size of the sun's disk, moving steadily. And in fact, on November 11th, it's going to go not up here. It's going to make almost a full <coughs> transit right across the uh, disk of the sun. And, and it will last about five hours. It's going to start at 7.30 in the morning and come to an end at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. You have a good-sized telescope. You'll be able to perceive the black silhouette, the disk of Mercury, as it moves across the sun. Again. I don't know if you get your jollies out of that. I personally, you know, to me it's not a big deal, but it'll be the last time for 20-some-odd uh, years. 2020, the Great Conjunction, December 21st. Did you notice, um, well, before I get into that, here is my version of Ebbets Field, <laughs> the, Hayden, the, one, the, the old Hayden Planetarium, and uh, I miss this place so much. Uh, I don't know how many of you do. I, I miss this like, like anything, even though we have a s modernized cube where the old facility, the old Art Deco facility once stood. One of the things I loved about the Hayden Planetarium, the old Hayden Planetarium, was the Copernican Hall of the Sun. Remember this? Yep. Before you went to the big show upstairs, you'd go downstairs, and this magnificent model of the solar system. And it wasn't the fact that the planets were uh, the correct distance. You couldn't do that. And it wasn't the fact that they were the correct size. That was impossible. But in terms of time, the Earth would take 12 minutes to go around the sun, one minute for each month. It took Jupiter about two, and, two hours and 26 minutes to go around. Saturn would take six hours. I'd always get excited when Saturn and Jupiter were close in together. When I, when I came in here, that's the first thing I looked for, was to see where Saturn and Jupiter was. Because you didn't, you know, on visits, you never saw them, you know. Even in this picture, here's where Saturn was, here's where Jupiter was, and they all moved around the ceiling, uh, and they each had moons going around it as well. Later on, they added black light to make them luminescent in the dark. It was a, it was a wonderful exhibit. 
Here is Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, when they get together in the real sky, it's really good. It doesn't happen very often. Only once about every 20 years do Jupiter and Saturn get close together to each other in the sky. Now, many of you saw the planets this, this summer. We had a whole string of them. We had Mars, we had Venus, Jupiter, Saturn. Jupiter and Saturn this summer were separated by about 25 degrees. This upcoming summer, they're going to get closer. They're going to be separated by only about 15 degrees. And in 2020, the summer of 2020, they're going to be separated by only about 5 degrees during the summertime, the distance of the pointer stars and the Big Dipper. So they're going to be close. It's, it's really going to be great to look at. And of course, we've all seen it. I, mean, I hope you've all seen it. The rings of Saturn, Jupiter, and the four Galilean satellites. And when they come, it, when they are in conjunction with each other on that every once every 20 year period, usually they're separated by one or two degrees. But in 2020, not so. Now they're going to be a bit closer than that. You want to know how close? Let me give you an idea how close. Let me use the Big Dipper. And of course, you all know Mizar and Alcor and the handle of the Big Dipper. They are separated by two tenths of a degree, 12 arc minutes. They are also used sometimes as an eye test, because Mizar is second magnitude and Alcor is fourth, and they're only separated by 12 arc minutes. And some people have a difficulty splitting them because they're very, very close together. Now, I'm reading all of your minds. I'm tuning in on every single person in this room. And you know what I'm hearing right now in my mind? Joe, are you telling us that in December of 2020, on the 21st of December, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be as close together in the sky as Mizar and Alcor? And you know what I'll say to that? No. <laughs> no, they're not going to come as close as that. They're going to be half as close as that. Six arc minutes. Which means that if you train your telescope on them that night, and I don't care, you can have high power, 100, 150 power, you'll be able to get both of them in the same field of view. You'll be able to see Saturn and its rings, Jupiter, and the four Galilean satellites, three on one side, Europa, the lone satellite, on the other. Try to imagine that. I'm sure many of you have seen Jupiter and its moons and Saturn separately. But on this night, you're going to get two for the price of one. How often does that happen, you say? How often do they get that close? Six arc minutes apart or less. OK? Well, let's see. September 16th, 1623, there were five arc minutes apart. Then comes 2020, six arc minutes. That's a 400-year wait. We have to wait 400 years for this to happen. Guess what? We only have to wait 80 years for the next time, 2080. My daughter may be here in 20. I'm not. I'll see it from a completely different aspect. But I could be here in 2080. You know, take some vitamins, do a lot of good wishing. Well, so it goes. After that, another 400 or so year wait, August 24th, 2417, five arc minutes. So this doesn't happen very often. But it's going to happen in 2020. P.S. It happens right on the Capricornus Sagittarius border. Those are late summer, early fall constellations. This is mid, oh, the beginning of winter. They're only going to be at sunset that day, about 10 degrees above the horizon. So if you want to see them higher up, above the schmutz, maybe you might want to consider taking a pre-Christmas vacation to Florida or the Caribbean, where they'll be a bit higher in the sky. But even if you can, Jupiter is certainly bright enough, and Saturn, too. If you know exactly where to look, you can see them in the daytime sky with your telescope. So that's, again, something, something interesting to look for in 2020. Then we have 2021. And for that, we are talking about June 10th, a sunrise scimitar. You know, after the solar eclipse last year, I heard not a few commentators on television and radio or even see in the newspapers well, we had a great American eclipse, and the next one is going to be in 2024. So make sure you take good care of those eclipse glasses. Put them away somewhere. You won't have to break them out again until 2024. It's almost seven years from now. Everybody overlooked this eclipse. How could they overlook this eclipse? The eclipse of June 10th, 2021. Now, admittedly, it's not going to be a total eclipse, but uh, let's take a look at it. Sunrise Scimitar. It is a beautiful sight to see it. 
the sun rise with you know, almost you know 70 80 90 percent covered this is an, a view of a sunrise eclipse as the moon was approaching as the sun was approaching the annular phase of an eclipse and sure enough on june 10th 2021 we are going to have a solar eclipse and of course you've seen many maps showing this depiction depicting this where the, the shadow moves in this time over uh over north america goes on a course from left to right or from west to east this one actually is going to pass directly over the north pole you're at the north pole that day you'll be able to see uh, an annular eclipse of the midnight yeah. sun how about that yeah. and then it moves then it moves on and off the surface of the earth now i love this i love i love oddities like this it's june 10th in 11 days we have the first day of summer well on the first day of summer what happens the northern hemisphere pretend my head is the earth now the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun that's why it gets warm during the summer because we're tilted toward the sun and getting a lot of sunlight now with the eclipse the shadow of the moon is going to strike the earth but it's going to strike not over the north polar region it's going to go beyond the north polar region it's going to be over the top so to speak and as it moves across the surface of the earth it'll then pass over the north pole and then back out into space that's what's going to happen so again if if where my finger is is the north pole the shadow is going to touch beyond the north pole from this perspective and what does that mean that means something very odd if you live in north america Again, normally you expect the, the shadow to move from right, left to right across the surface of the Earth. But look what happens if we turn this picture upside down, like that. Here's where we are. Here's North America, right? And here's New York City, right? Look at the path. It starts at sunrise here just north of the Great Lakes, and then it moves north and northwest. My goodness, the shadow is moving backwards. Was the moon out of its alignment or out of its orbit? No, just the way the perspective is. From our vantage point, we're on the other side of the North Pole. The sun's up here, out, you know, beyond the Earth, up past the ceiling. But because of the way everything is, the perspective here, it appears that the shadow, relative to us, is moving backwards across the surface of the Earth. And that's kind of strange. Usually the shadow, when it arrives, comes in from the west. Not so this time around. This time around, the shadow comes up from the east and south. Look at that. Comes in and goes out. See that big red blob? That's the point area of the annular eclipse. And as I said, it goes right over the North Pole. But look at that. We're right in the zone of visibility for this particular eclipse. There it is. There's the path of annularity. Because the shadow hits the Earth at such an oblique angle, instead of getting, as is normal or custom, a circular shadow or slightly oval type shape shadow look at this the shadow almost looks like a cigar when it contacts the earth and it's still fairly oval as it moves up across the surface of the earth and if you're north of lake superior at sunrise you will see an annular eclipse of the sun the sun will rise like a red ring as seen from that area and all these lines you say something crisscrossing and like what does all this mean or anything i'm going to make it easy for you all right you all have to do is look at two specific lines the yellow line here, this yellow line is solar is maximum of solar eclipse at sunrise. In other words, the sun, when it comes up at sunrise, will be at peak, at maximum eclipse. So in other words, if you're along this yellow line, you've missed half of the eclipse, the first half. But it's coming to a peak just as the sun is coming up over your horizon. And here, this line is the line that indicates greatest eclipse 80% and that comes down like this and look at that we're right there the tri-state New York area 80% and this is the sunrise line so at sunrise people right along this yellow line will see the peak of the eclipse if you're in Toronto Buffalo Niagara Falls moving further south through Binghamton on to New York and the tri-state area you will see a total eclipse uh, not a total I wish I was total a partial eclipse of the sun of great magnitude at sunrise. And pretty much this is what it's going to look like from here in the New York metropolitan area. And interestingly, because it's at sunrise, the peak of the eclipse, the crescent 
will rapidly seem to pivot over a period of a few minutes as the sun is coming up over the horizon. Where are you, sun? There you go. There's your sunrise, June 10th, 2021. All right, you've had enough. Move. Go on. Thank you. Think about that for a second. What an incredible photo op this is. Think about a place that you might want to be on that morning. Where were you, by the way, on June 8th, 2004? That was the morning of the Venus transit. We all got up early and went out to a place where we had a clear view of the east-northeastern sky so we could see the sun come up, so we could see Venus already on the disk of the sun. Well, there you go. Just go right back there again on June 10th, 2021 to get a view of the rising sickle, the rising scimitar of solar eclipse. Break out those glasses. You're not going to have to wait until 2024. Break them out because you're going to need them again in 2021. And if you find a nice spot, think of, as I said, the photo op that you may have. The, the photo possibilities are endless. Look at that. Oh, wow. That would be nice, wouldn't it? To hang on your wall and find, find, you know, take a picture of that. That's what awaits us in 2021. Goodbye. <laughs> Lying off. In the Farmer's Almanac, they once said that um, there's 100, exactly 100 days from New Year's Eve to the Bluebird. I guess so. 2022, the last of my celestial spectaculars. This is the one that I am really awaiting. In fact, if you were to come to me and say, Joe, what would you trade? Or which, which of these two events would you want to see? The total eclipse of the sun on April 8, 2024, or this event. And I would say, if you can guarantee me that everything falls into place the way it should, I'll take this event over the total eclipse of the sun. Not the fact that if you've never seen a total eclipse of the sun, by all means, see the total eclipse. But if you, like me, I've seen 12 totals. I've never seen a really, I, I saw the Leonids in 2001. I saw what was then a meteor storm that two, 3,000 out from Arizona. Watch. Will a broken comet bring a storm of meteors? Okay, here is, in September of 1995, people all over the world were reporting to the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams, the IAU, a new comet. My goodness, I, I just discovered a new comet. Look at that. It's, and it's almost naked eye. It's, it's got well, to be like fifth, fifth magnitude, maybe fifth, sixth magnitude. It's a new comet. Telegram the Bureau. Tell them I discovered it. Make my claim. And you can see the, uh, the announcement on this circular. The Bureau has received numerous reports from observers worldwide of independent discoveries of this comet. What was this comet? Comet schwachmann bachmann Three. Would you believe these two guys, Schwachmann and Bachmann, discovered three comets together? This was the third one that they discovered. But this was the one that may turn out to be their best. They know they're long gone, but they may be remembered for this one. Because this comet, originally we said it was just an outburst. Comets do this. Sometimes comets suddenly increase in brightness. This one increased from 13th magnitude to almost 5th magnitude over a span of a couple of days. Remember, some of you may remember in 2007, we had a comet, Comet Holmes, which was like 300 million miles out in space, and all of a sudden it became like a million times brighter. It happens. The comets do have these, a fissure may open up, volatile gases were released, dusters expelled, the comet gets very, very bright. And that's what we originally thought this, that happened to this comet. Until a few weeks later when we started looking at it more closely and we discovered that there wasn't one comet, there were two, and then three, and then four. Well, what happened? Well, here's how the comet normally looked. This is Schwachmann Wachmann in its normal state. But after this outburst occurred in 1995, September, and people started looking at it with the telescope, <laughs> this is what we ended up with. We ended up with not one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This comet is falling apart. The comet's fractured. That's why it got so bright. When it broke apart, it and pieces breaking off too, and dust being expelled all over. Well, here's a, a movie. This was an animation that was made in 2006, 11 years after the breakup, from the Spitzer Space Telescope. And you can see, this is just one of the pieces. Look, what, look what's happening. That piece is breaking off all by itself into the multi pieces. And all of this uh, celestial debris being sprayed out into space. All of that stuff going out into space. 
of all different sizes and shapes and quantities and whatever. It's a celestial litter bug. That's what this is. Well, if this story sounds familiar, almost every astronomy book often uh, tells the story of this comet, Comet Vila in 1846. This comet broke into two pieces. And there you see it, piece one, piece two. <coughs> and then six years later, six and a half years later, the comet returned, and the pieces were further apart and a bit dimmer, but they were still there. But then in 1859, no comet. 1865, no comet. What happened? Where'd it go? The comet is gone. Probably pulverized the pieces. It was breaking up, just like we're seeing now with Schwachmann of Achmann. And then in 1872, we passed across the orbit of that comet. Comet was nowhere to be found, but what we saw in its place was a spectacular display of shooting stars. The pieces of Comet Bela all raining down, tens of thousands per hour. Some said it was the greatest display since the Leonids of 1833. A spectacular, beautiful display of shooting stars. The remnants of what was once a comet going around the sun. So now the question is, and this happened with Schwachmann Wachmann. And to answer that question, not one, not two, but three independent observations and projections made by three different teams of observers. The first one was from Germany, uh, a group of meteor experts led by Rainer Alt, was his name. I hope I pronounced that. My wife is German, but uh, may pronounce it better than I. But Rainer Alt and his team studied this and said that on May 31st, 2022, at 12.55 a.m., we're going to pass to within 37,200 miles of the center of that debris field. That's pretty darn close. Remember, the moon is about a quarter million miles away. We're going to pass 37,000. But wait a minute. Right after that was another independent group of people led by Minero, uh, uh, Minero Sato in Japan. And his group studying this said, May 31st, 12.59 a.m., 35,300 miles, we're going to pass through that debris field. And then Russia. Russia is represented by one person, a gentleman by the name of um, Mikhail Maslov. And um, I, I, I don't know him personally. We communicate by email. Isn't this wonderful that we can talk to people on the other side of the globe and have conversations like pen pals? And I contacted Mikhail Maslov, and I said, and, and he is a noted meteor expert. And I said to him in an email, I said, Mikhail, you no doubt have heard <coughs> what uh, Mikhail Sato and Rainier Olt have said about this situation in 2022. What do you think about it? And Mikhail has his own methodology. Um, he calls it the vertical trails method of forecasting or a, a meteor shower. And a few days after I had pinged him and said, could you look into this for me? What do you think? Well, what do you think we might get? A few days later, I got back his response. And I was expecting something. Mikhail with, uh, is the kind of person that often throws cold water on a lot of the other predictions sometimes. He says, well, you know, they're saying 150 an hour for the Perseids next year. I looked at it, and it might be only about 80 or 90 an hour, because I don't really see it. Well, I don't, I don't think it's going to be quite as prolific as what they're saying it's going to be. He was, the, he was that, he's that kind of a person. So I expect him to say something like, well, it looks good, but we're probably not going to get you know, maybe a few hundred an hour, perhaps. When I got the email from Mikhail Maslow and read it, something occurred to me. And uh, my wife, Renato, raise your hand. Raise your hand. That's my wife, ladies and gentlemen, right there. And she'll, and she'll vouch for me, or she'll verify this for me. After I read Mikhail's email, something happened to me. Uh, they couldn't get the stain out of the pants. <laughs> I ruined my pants. My wife had to get rid of it. Here's, here is his message to me. I could say that I am optimistic of the prospect of a very significant meteor display in 2022. The basic model gives meteor activity with a ZHR, zenithal hourly rate, max, of 600 to 700. However, considering that the comet has broken into several parts, 
the real activity should be one to two orders higher, with up to 10,000 to 100,000 oh meteors on a ZHR scale, populated chiefly by bright and very slow meteors, eight miles a second, 12 kilometers. You know what that means? When you go out and look at the Perseid meteors, the Perseid meteor shower, you see meteors entering the atmosphere at 30, meteor, uh, 30 miles per second. When you look at the Leonids, they enter at 45 miles per second. Eight miles per second. We're talking about meteors that are going like this. And we're talking about like that on a scale of 10,000 to 100,000 per hour. Oh my God. Now you're probably saying to yourself, well, where is this activity going to come from? Earlier in the 20th century, there was a minor meteor shower caused by this comet from the constellation Hercules. They called it the Tau Hercules. But Mikhail was very gracious to send me this uh, diagram. said, well, that's when the comet was just spewing material. But we're talking now about a comet breaking up physically, breaking up into different pieces in a completely different sector or different orbit. So the radiant is not going to be in Hercules anymore. It's going to be in Bootes. He labeled it the Tau Hercules, but it's in Bootes, not too far from Arcturus. Where's Arcturus? At 1 AM or thereabouts on the 31st of May, Bootes, or Arcturus, is way up there, 60 degrees high in the sky. Oh, and the phase of the moon? He says, wow, well, yeah, there's probably going to be a full moon that night, right? Or give us moon of light. New moon. New moon. All the pieces are in place for what could be the greatest or most stupendous celestial fireworks display since the Leonids that Dr. Franklin, rest his soul, missed in 1960, and all of us missed in 66. We may gonna get a second shot of this if Mikhail is correct. Mikhail uh, Maslow is right in 2022. What's the weather forecast? <laughs> I'll tell you what. Almost a sure thing, it's always clear, mostly clear, in Arizona in May. In the desert southwest in May, I'm heading maybe to Arizona just to be on the safe side for that. I want to finish my talk tonight. Yes, he is finally finished. <laughs> Sorry to have bored you for the last hour. <laughs> but I, wanted to, I want to finish with a line from this gentleman. This is a man by the name of Garrett Service. He lived in the New York metropolitan area in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and he wrote several old classic books on astronomy and stargazing, of which I am very fortunate to have in my personal library at home. And Mr. Service uh, was a very eloquent speaker, and he was a very eloquent writer, and, and in one of his books came this passage, which I thought would be the perfect way to end our discussion tonight. He writes, surely, there is not another field of human contemplation so wonderfully rich as astronomy. It is so easy to reach, so responsive to every mood, so stimulating, uplifting, abstracting, and infinitely consoling. Everybody may not be a chemist. Everybody may not be a geologist, or pray tell, a mathematician. But everybody may be and ought to be in a modest personal way an astronomer. For stargazing is a great medicine for the soul. And I thank you very much for listening. Stuff that I talked about, or I'm sure there's some questions. You didn't mention the.